Welcome to the carnewscafe.com podcast. Hi everyone, this is Adam Yamada Hanf with the Car News Cafe podcast. Please visit us online at carnewscafe.com. You can also send us a tweet at carnewscafe. Or if you prefer Facebook, you can check us out at facebook.com slash carnewscafe online. And this is Aaron Turpin from carnewscafe.com. Make sure to visit us on Google+. Adam is our social media expert, and he is everywhere but there. That is where Nicholas and I mostly talk about alternative powertrains and vehicles. I think you'll enjoy it. And this is uh, Nicholas Zart signing in for Car News Cafe. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, don't forget to check us out on Google+. Plus. We have a pretty uh, healthy community there, and this is indeed where we do talk about alternative drivetrains and all that kind of good stuff. But if you want real interaction, go to Facebook because Adam is all over the place. <laughs> so this week, Tesla stock has uh, gone up quite a bit this is a uh, due to a couple of reasons they've <laughs> tesla stock has gone up nicholas over to you after tesla doo dude and the stock did go up adam couldn't keep a straight face and it was very hard and very tough on all of us <laughs> because we also could not keep a straight face yeah so i wrote an article about a year ago on torque news about whether or not tesla was going to make twenty thousand cars this year and one of the things that I hinged that on was, were they going to start selling in Europe and how soon? I predicted that they were going to start selling them sometime in uh, July or August. I figured halfway through the year. And sure enough, that's when they start. I personally still don't think they're going to make their 20,000 goal, but I think they're going to be awful damn close. So it's kind of a, a nitpicking over numbers. Yeah, indeed. Actually, they in quarter two, they sold 5,150 cars. So if they average this, Aaron, they will beat your estimates by about, what, 500 cars or so? Well, there you go. So yes, indeed, Tesla stock went up. But um, the real story behind is actually Tesla drove the prices of their Model S up, especially with the options and all that good stuff which, of course, at first everybody thought would freak out the entire planet and plunge us into complete chaos. But people who buy Teslas do not care about a few thousand dollars more, or they don't care as much as most other people would. Anyway, that had the uh, reaction to drive up their uh, stock prices. And also, it was perfect because it introduced the uh, Model S sales in Europe. So the Model S is now being sold in Europe. No doo-doo there. Yeah, the the good news for Tesla is that it, it looks like since April and May, their stock has steadily gone up from in the sort of forty to fifty dollar range to currently today it's trading one fifty three to one fifty four, and it seems to me like most people are still very interested in buying Tesla stock. But I guess the question for financial analysts or regular investors who are buying Tesla is it overpriced? I noticed their balance sheet still, from an investor's standpoint, still doesn't look all that great. They are, you know, an innovative company and foresee them going anywhere. If I were an investor and I were putting money into uh, Wall Street, I would see Tesla as a good longer term option simply because it's a company that's going to do nothing but grow. So there's no reason to walk away from it. They've proven that they're not going to die. So we're past the point where it's a risky investment. But I think that people that are jumping into it that think that they're going to get a fast payoff, I think are probably making the wrong decision because I don't see Tesla, at least in terms of stock price, I don't see them growing very quickly. But I'm not an analyst. I'm not a, I'm not a stock person. I'm one of those people that packs guns and ammo and lives in a bunker. I've done a little bit of stock investing. I mean, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not trading for a living or Ford. that's true. I do own Ford stock. I should divulge that just so everyone knows. So you should buy Fords. Looking at Tesla right now, it, I mean, my personal opinion is that they're probably going to pull back from the this 150, 155 range because it's pretty overpriced. That doesn't mean I don't think they're a bad company to invest in, just not at this current time. Yeah, I, actually, it's probably true. They might pull down a little bit. And it's normal because after an IPO, after the gold rush, everybody kind of pulls back and slows down a little bit. But I think Aaron is right. It is a company that will go into the future that will do a lot. I mean, they're still doing a heck of a lot and not just car wise. They're doing a lot with their chargers or doing a lot with their technology. And they're also doing a lot. I mean, Musk is also involved with other companies. So this is a company that seems like it will go on for a long time. 
as far as so nicholas just finished his week with the ford fusion energy and i guess he'll tell us about how he liked driving it for the week he talked about this a little bit last week yeah i was pretty excited about the fusion energy actually i was excited because that was the first real hybrid i drove was the original fusion and i was impressed that it could go on the electricity alone up until 47 and a half uh, miles per hour but the new fusion was even better i mean 22 23 miles on the electricity alone was really great it's not based on the mondeo platform anymore but it does the work really well the one thing that struck me the most is bringing people into the car. All of them would look at me with big eyes and go, that's a Ford? So it's very impressive. Okay, so just to get it out of the way, yes, it doesn't have much trunk space. Yes, you won't be able to bring your three kids and uh, your uh, significant other and all the suitcases in the trunk. It doesn't have a lot of trunk space. But as far as an everyday car you can bring to work and you can also bring important people in the car, it felt very luxurious. It felt very good. And for $40,000, I think it was pretty much spot on. Obviously, with the Volt um, slashing out $5,000 and all the other cars slashing uh, a few thousand dollars here and there, I think Ford is going to follow suit. They're not going to rush themselves, but they're going to do it eventually. Um, but overall, I was really impressed by uh, the feel of the car. Just very cl quickly, I live in Long Beach, California, and we decided to go to Encinitas. And it was a freeing experience to drive around town on the electricity alone and then get on the highway and switch to hybrid mode um they have something called ev plus so you just click on that ev plus option and it reserves what's left of the battery pack for later so once we got to encinitas we went back into ev mode we puttered around the city in uh, in electricity mode and then back again on highway in hybrid and then back again in long beach on ev mode and we still had plenty of electricity to go to our friend's place and come back home. And I got to tell you, that is one heck of a great freedom. And um, I understand now how Volt owners reported having gasoline anxiety because I was really trying to maximize my electricity. So it was a great experience. People seemed to really like it. And I think what surprised me the most is how people would just go in the car and go, wow, that's a Ford? Well, I've always been impressed with the, with the uh, Fusion impressed. I've always been impressed. I have all my teeth. <laughs> let me let me put my dentures back in. <laughs> I've always been impressed with the Ford Fusion, and I think it's a, a bit of a, a stretch to compare it to the Volt, simply because although they're both considered mid-sized sedans, that's only because of the EPA's interior uh, volume ratings. That's how they uh, classify a car for EPA test ratings. The Volt is not a mid-sized sedan. The Volt is a small car. And in comparison to any other mid-sized sedan, the Volt is, is tiny. Barely seats for it, has no luggage space to speak of. It's not the same car. So to compare the Volt and, and the uh, Ford, uh, at least the Ford Fusion, it's unfair. But on the other hand, the Fusion Energy and the Volt are, in terms of powertrain, are about as comparable as you can get. Since we're talking about futuristic cars, I wanted to quickly mention the uh, Audi design for the Ender's Game movie that comes out first part of November. It's a totally virtual reality car. It has not been built in physical form, but it was specifically made for this movie. And it's a really cool looking design if you just look at it. It has the dumbest name on the planet, but it kind of fits because of the film. It's called the Audi Fleet Shuttle Quattro. But if you're a fan of Ender's Game, if, if you've read the Ender series by Orson Scott Card, then you'll know why that fits because it's a very, in this Ender's Game itself is very military because that's kind of the plot. And so it's a really cool car. And uh, I, I didn't do anything on Car News Cafe about it, but I did write it up on Torque News just because I like the look of the car. So I wanted to talk about it. So talking about bleeps and lights and things that make no sense, one of the things that I think a lot of um, readers and listeners will agree with is that modern cars have way too many beeps and lights and things like that, and most of them actually make no sense. I think one of the things we were talking about before is the infamous uh, engine check light on. What the heck does that mean? Most people don't even know what it is, and most of the time the engine doesn't sound bad or anything like that. Or one of my pet peeves is, yeah, you know, the key is in the ignition and I open the door because I need to step out for five seconds and you have that ding, 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 beep, beep, beep thing. Come on, guys, we're not morons. We know how to drive. We know how to do things. And it might be good one in a thousand times, but most of the time it's just plain all annoying. And in fact, well, I'm not going to say what I do with those things. A lot of those lights are mandated, actually. They're required. But the engine light specifically, that's one that really bothers me because we have a lot of modern technology in these cars. We have cars that are 
that are able to read our text messages to us, and then we can talk back to them, and they will type that text message to our friends while we're driving, right? A car that can do that, and it can't tell me what the damn engine light is saying. You know, the engine light comes on, and you just look at it and go, great. Well, what is it? Is it time for an oil change? Is the transmission about to explode? Did I put the wrong gas in it? What's going on? You know, it doesn't tell you. And then if you do have a code reader, it's probably a generic one you bought at the auto parts store for 30 or $40. And if the code happens to be proprietary to the car, which manufacturers have proprietary codes, the reader's not going to tell you anything either. It's just going to give you the code, and then you're still going to have to go on the Internet and find it. I think that at the very least... The codes should be displayed with their proper names when the engine light comes on, at the very, very least. It would be so easy to do. Modern cars for the last five years have LCD screens all over the place. There's no reason this can't be done. And it's, to me, just a huge annoyance. When I see an engine light, I just want to punch the dash and say, shut up. Something people should consider is that dealerships make the most money, usually in their service departments. So if they can charge you a little bit just for extra diagnostic time, they have no problem with that. <laughs> well, and that's really funny because most people should know by now that you can drive down the street to your local AutoZone or Pep Boys or most of those auto parts stores, and they will read the codes for free. In fact, they'll do a lot of testing for free. You can pull up to the pull up to them or have your car towed over to them, and not only can you buy the parts and do the repair right in the parking lot, they'll come out and with very few exceptions in certain states that are run by communists, they can come out and they will do the diagnostic testing. They'll do battery tests, alternator tests. They'll do uh, EGR tests. They'll do, I mean, they'll do a lot of tests for you. And they'll do it absolutely free because they know that if they find the problem, chances are you're going to walk into their store and buy the part to fix it. Yeah, actually, I didn't know about that. That's, like, that's pretty cool. I, I'm going to make sure to use it once in a while. I think the biggest problem is all of these lights and all of these dings and beeps and things like that, yeah, I mean, they, they serve a purpose, and, and it's right. A lot of people are, are not all with it when they drive, and they need those reminders and everything. It's just a shame for those of us who are a little bit more concentrated on what we're doing. And I guess the hard part is how do you make those things not intrusive and or just intrusive enough and... Uh, they just rubbed me the wrong way. And again, this is because probably I come from a background of old cars where you really only had an engine, you had four wheels and some sort of a roof on top of it, and that was it. And the only electronic was, uh, well, the distributor, basically, in a nutshell. So, yeah, it's a tough one. I, I understand. I still don't like it. That was my do-it-yourself tip for the day. I know Jeremy Clarkson from Top Gear, which is, in fact, the most watched factual TV show well, just in any, history. Just the original. He, he always says he doesn't like American cars because they make too much noise in terms of beeps and all that. So, yeah, you know what? The whole Top Gear thing, I'm so over Top Gear. You know what? I mean, even Clarkson is a caricature of himself. It's too much. If you really want to watch the original Top Gear with the original cast from the, the late 80s, early 90s, watch um, Fifth Gear and Wheeler and Dealer. That is funny. I'm sorry. That still has that funny British thing. Modern Top Gear, it's it's not funny anymore. And I think the, the day that Clarkson said the Tesla Roadster was a piece of you-know-what and that he much rather have the Honda Clarity, he would choose it over the Roadster, I thought, well, you know what? That's it. That show is done. It's over with. We know who's uh, advertising. And it's not even entertainment anymore. It doesn't Nicholas make me laugh. Does not like his it's TV not really fun. Beating up the old cars. It's opinions. just a bunch of old guys uh, getting together and having fun. And by the way, I'm probably the same age. I shouldn't say that. But anyway, sorry, Top Gear. Move on. Shape up, do something fun again, be real. This is not even funny anymore. It's the same. I personally like Top Gear because it's it's sort of like, <laughs> I think, what every auto journalist dreams he could actually do with cars. <laughs> Probably my favorite thing that Top Gear has ever done recently was when they made the, uh, what did they call it? It was, they were, they were challenged to make a Volt car, a car like the Volt. And so they made that huge monstrosity where they, they took a, a, a chassis from something and they, and they basically built it out of leftover construction stuff off of some construction site. So it's this giant oh, silver-looking yeah. thing with a big diesel generator <laughs> mounted in the back of it. It was hilarious. They took, they took uh, lawn chairs and strapped them into the thing. And they were driving around town in it. It was awesome. Yeah, I personally love Top Gear. I don't know if Nicholas got hit on the head recently, but that's my opinion. 
Actually, I, there is one show uh, you can go see online that I kind of like. It's probably can catch it on YouTube. They're called uh, Everyday Driver. I, I like these two. I, I like what they do, and that's in many ways that's what I'm trying to do with my videos. Except I haven't found anybody to do it here locally with yet. If you can get over the fact that they use one metaphor after the other, they actually do a pretty good show, and they they do a pretty good uh, review. And the Have last two about ones other I saw shows funny enough? was um, Nissan GTR know, and the this uh, Mitsubishi Lancer is Evolution. Awesome. But they really conveyed the message really well, and I thought reason. that was really good. So um, hat tip to these guys. Do they convey a message about spoked wheels? Because I know that that's like your pet peeve. <laughs> okay, can we talk was, about, please, can we please talk about spokes wheel? What is up with spokes wheel? Spokes wheel everywhere. Every single idiotic car to the best car out there has spoke wheels. Whatever happened to beautifully carved, intricate um, 70s Maserati era wheels? I don't understand it. Only one of our cars has spoke wheels, and that's because it came with it, and that was the Subaru. But both of my Alphas have full wheels, and they're beautiful. So I don't understand. I spoke to um, Jay Mays at Ford, and I told him, and I said, you know, every car in the world right now, well, maybe short of trucks and bigger, bigger things, have spoke wheels. Why do we always have to have spoke wheels? How many variation of spoke wheels can you do? It's just, it's boring. So I'm, I'm waiting for something else. I, I want to see something different. And I, I don't know, spoke wheels, too much, too much. Move on. You know what I saw the other day? It was by the Air Force Base in Cheyenne. Well, the Air National Guard Base. I was sitting at a stoplight waiting. We were all in the pickup truck. We had a bunch of groceries in the back. And we're sitting in a stoplight, and rolling through the stoplight is a full-size Hummer, right? Like the military surplus full-size Hummer. And they put these gigantic 28-inch wheels on the damn thing with tiny little profile tires. Those, you know, like little four-inch tires. And I watched the thing roll by, and I said, holy crap, that's got to be the most useless piece of machinery I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> it was just ugly. And they must have thought, you know, we be rolling, they hate it. You know, I mean, they're all... <laughs> oh, man, it was horrible. I shouldn't ask Adam what the ugliest thing he saw lately is because I'm currently on his screen. <laughs> I guess I guess ugliest vehicle would have to be what have I seen lately which I just thought was really ugly. Most people don't know but Adam never actually goes outside. You know, I saw a PT Cruiser the other day and I really don't like those. Ford Festiva? Have you guys ever seen a Ford Festiva? Ford Festivas. They're still running around. <laughs> I can't believe well, that's because they use that little tiny Ford four-cylinder engine that won't die. It's like the Willys flathead of Ford, you know. It's just it's one of those engines that you can put a 50 caliber bullet through and it'll still run. Actually, the Ford Festiva was originally the Kia Pride, and that was, I believe, Korea's basically first car. And the reason it was called Pride was because it was a huge amount of pride for Koreans to have this car. Quite honestly, they were... Very well built and reliable, just their sort of dinky little cars. Ugly as sin. <laughs> yeah, no one wants to be in one. Nicholas wants to talk about the Toyota TMG P002 EV that was at Pike's Peak. You sure that's not an engine code? So I had a really great interview with uh, Steve Wickham. Steve Wickham is the uh, person in charge of the uh, TMG, the Toyota TMG. So that's the uh, the guy who races the P002, the electric uh, prototype racer. And the interview was very revealing because I don't think we can talk about Toyota without talking about hybrids. But when we think of Toyota, we certainly don't think of electric cars. And we certainly don't think of racing electric cars. Toyota... And electric cars are very far removed, and Toyota always puts down electric cars. And the leitmotif is very simple. Batteries are not ready. People are not ready. Range is not ready. However, behind the scenes, Toyota is actually using a lot of, uh, of electric motors and doing a lot of tests. And the uh, TMG P002, that's a mouthful, I know, is used extensively. It, uh, it holds a, uh, a speed record on the Nürburgring. And as you might have seen, it was raced last year at Pikes Peak. It was raced this year at Pikes Peak. And the interview with Steve was very interesting because it showed that uh, other aspect of Toyota we might not know. Steve is also in charge of the whole NASCAR racing. And uh, 
He is an enthusiast. He's a he's a very smart guy. I like him a lot. Typical English guy who is a car guy, and he sees the potential with electric motors. But he also you, you'll have to read the articles because I'll go in much more details. But he basically races that car with his team on a shoestring budget. It was really incredible. But he did say one thing in the end, and I thought made a lot of sense. And this is applicable for anybody, anywhere, whatever you drive. He says the biggest problem we have in our society is young kids have automatic access to big cars, highly automated big cars with a lot of horsepower. He says he learned how to drive on a De Chauveau, and if you've ever driven a De Chauveau, you know how to drive practically anything else on this planet. This is a bouncy car. If you step on the accelerator, it will bounce until you figure out how to smoothen it out. And um, it also helps you because it's so limited in power. It helps you understand when to brake, when to accelerate, and when to gauge traffic. And this is something we just don't have these days. So the interview was very interesting, and I, I enjoyed it. Anyway, that was a side note. Well, I will agree with him that the Doshevo is one of the most fun cars you can ever drive. If you get an older one from the 60s, they have no dashboard to speak of. You can literally stand up. You take the top off, right, the cabriolet, you take the top off. You can literally stand in it and run the pedals and drive it. Uh, the only thing you'll have to lean down for is to move the gear shift. <laughs> and by the way, the, the De Chauveau is, I think, the, at least to my knowledge, the only car that does not use torsion bars. So it leans, and boy, does it lean. It, it can lean until you scrape the side skirts. And they were um, events in France where they would try to turn one upside down. It's virtually impossible, but the only way you could do it is to barrel down a steep a hill going down and then turn it quickly, as quickly as you can, and eventually the car would roll over, but practically impossible. Now, the funny thing is that car has no torsion bars, and that car handles so well. As soon as you're, you know, get over the fear of it's going to tip over, it does not tip over. Anyway, yeah, it's a really cool car. Once you learn how to drive that, you can drive anything else. One thing about the uh, about the Doshevo is that I could sit here and I could talk about that car all day because it's probably one of my favorite cars. I love those things. And if I was a car collector, if I if in the position where I was collecting a lot of cars, I think that's the only one I would bother collecting a series of where I would want a lot of them. They're just they're just really cool little cars and they're lots of fun and they're way better than Volkswagen Bugs and similar vehicles. They're just a whole different world. They're just nothing but fun. And anybody of any size can sit in them. That's that's the great thing. They're they're cars that anybody can sit in, anybody can figure out how to drive because they're so simple and you can do anything you want with them, you know. I mean they were literally made to replace a horse and cart. So they're they're just the coolest little car you can get. That's I'll I'll sit, I'll end it there. Coolest little car you can get. And by the way, if you don't know what they look like or technically what they are like, it's a small um, a twin opposed piston engine. It's what is it? Less than five hundred cc. Um, it develops close to nothing as far as horsepower. So you really have to keep the revs going. The car is held together by clips. It's not bolted. Nothing. You can actually strip the car in about fifteen twenty minutes. And it's pretty famous for going on holidays with only a pair of pliers and a pair of screwdrivers. And that's it. That's all you'll ever need for that car. And maybe tape to tape it together in case anything happens. It's absolutely an amazing car. I've actually seen few around here, mainly because collectors like them. But yeah, there's so few parts on them that <laughs> they're actually quite reliable because there's not that much to break. If anybody wants to see what one looks like uh, from the era that Nicholas and I are talking about, go to the carnewscafe.com website. Look at last week's podcast, the podcast from 8.5. The cover for it is a Docevo being used the way they were meant to be used, which is, you know, full of lumber, driving along. And <laughs> Anyway, Adam, uh, what does the survey say? The survey came out this week. And it basically said that car buyers are taking fewer and fewer test drives, and they're shorter. It's pretty interesting. I would imagine the reason for this is that more people, before they even walk into a dealership or think about walking into a dealership, they've already done a lot of research online to figure out the exact car they want. So maybe test driving the car is sort of even a moot point. If if in your mind you've already decided what, what car you want to get. I think that's how they're thinking. And I, in some ways they're right. The survey did show that 
more people are doing more research before they ever uh, walk onto a dealership. I think the dealership model itself is starting to change or it needs to change because the dealership is built on an old paradigm where people didn't know much of anything about the car until they walked onto the lot and talk to somebody about it. And most people would buy a car based on they wanted a Ford or they wanted a Chrysler or whatever. Now, because there's so many choices, and frankly, a lot of them are basically the same thing with a different badge on them. People are spending more time, you know, we live in the information age. They're spending more time reading things like what we do, we produce, learning about the car, and then saying, okay, I've narrowed it down to these two or these three, and then going for a test drive. What bothers me and what I wrote about in this article is that they are going for these test drives, but they're only spending half an hour or less in this car. You can't know anything about a car in half an hour. I barely get to know where the gear shift is and, and how to run the lights by then. You have to spend a little bit of time in the car. And my I just gave some, some advice in the article of, of what I – think because as journalists as automotive journalists we're basically professional test drivers and what I tell people is spend the time in the car and I outline what you should be doing uh, how you should actually test drive a car because this is a this is three to five years at minimum of investment on your part once you buy this car you're going to own it on average for 10 years, but you're going to own it a minimum of three to five years before you can trade it in and get any sort of return on that trade in. And it's a, a huge investment for most people. It's a third of their income that's going to pay for this car. So you really need to think about what you're doing and how important that purchase is going to be. Uh, Nicholas, I believe he's, he's looking like he wants to say something. <laughs> I'm shocked, guys. Seriously, is anybody going to talk about the white elephant in the room? No? Well, what about dealers and dealerships? I mean, seriously, I think I remember seeing about five, six, seven years ago a uh, survey on the worst jobs and the worst reputations out there. And you know who were the last two guys? Real estate agents and uh, car salesmen. And so yesterday I heard uh, something about, I'm not going to name the, the name of the company, but a dealership who had turned down this lady because she wanted a plug-in hybrid and... She eventually went to another car company and bought just a regular hybrid, and she was really happy with it because the interaction went really well. So it's true. I, I went there to check out this company, to check out this dealership, and it's true. Dealers, salesmen haven't changed. They still act the same way. They still schmooze, and they still do all those things. They don't know how to recognize people. They don't know how to ask questions, and especially – they don't really know how to listen to people. Now, of course, this is a gross overgeneralization, but – it's true. An experience in dealerships is not a positive one. Have you ever wondered why Tesla is being fought tooth and nail by the dealership association so that Tesla doesn't sell directly to consumers? Well, that's because consumers don't like to go to dealerships, and that probably explains why they only spend a half hour. Who wants to spend a half hour with a salesman breathing down your neck saying, you got to buy this. this is a car for you. Oh, wait, I've got an even better one, which happens to be $5,000 more. It's totally normal. So I think that's the white elephant in the room. But yeah, that survey is a little scary. I don't understand why a uh, half hour you don't get a feel for a car. It takes a day at least. I think personally that there is a place for dealerships. I think independent dealerships will be around for a long time, and I don't, I don't see anything wrong with them. My problem is just that I think that they're not really moving with the times. They're not changing as fast as they need to. Because one of the things that we really need to see in a dealership in today's market is less salesmen and more information people. I think that the old paradigm of paying salesmen based on sales is wrong because it only gets them to push the sale. I think that they should be paid to interact with customers as customer service representatives because most people, by the time they come to that dealership and are on the lot to look at a car, they already know what car they want, or they have a very good idea. So the only job that the salesman should have at that point should be to show them the options for that car and similar cars that they have and take them out and show them the car and then give them a loaner because I'm with Nicholas. I think that at the minimum, people should drive the car for at least an hour. That's the bare minimum. And if possible, you should take a day off work, drive that car out, drive it during your commute, drive it during rush hour, park it at the grocery store to see how it does, take it places, stick the car seats in it, 
you know, do all the things you do every day in that car. The example I used was we had that Nissan Altima 3.5 SL. We literally changed the diaper on the trunk, on the trunk lid of that car, because that is the kind of thing that normal people do every day when they own a car. You do those sorts of things. And in half an hour or even an hour, you are not going to know everything about that car. You need to pair your phone with it and find out how it does talking on the hands-free. You need to find out how it's going to drive, how it's going to park. How is it going to do when you're just sitting in traffic for an hour waiting? You know, how is it? You need to know these things. Yeah, I think dealerships definitely, I mean, along with auto manufacturers, need to reconsider how their business model. I mean, I, I like that Tesla is sort of trying to say we want to redo this, but obviously the NADA is putting up a big fight against Tesla on that, and it's, you know, obvious because dealerships have a lot of money and they have a lot of clout and power, but it definitely isn't a pleasant experience. I mean, the times I've gone to look at cars with, with other people, I mean, they're definitely very bad salesmen. I think there's definitely salesmen who are good. I know a few, but they're few and far between, in my opinion. Yeah, I think it's like uh, adopting an animal these days. You can take it home for a few days or a few weeks and eventually take it. But I think you're right. And I think the one thing and the very first thing a salesman has to do in order to be a masterful uh, salesperson is listen, 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 listen. And you're right, Aaron. Paying them on, on a per sale basis is absolutely the wrong thing to do because these guys are just pushing bottom lines. And the worst thing that they can do and the worst thing that they do in the end is they give a lot of buyers buyer remorse. When you buy something you didn't really set out to buy and it's a little bit more expensive than that you wanted to. And then these buyers have to justify it and then they're automatically not happy. And I think you're right. Not test driving a car day is the worst thing you can do. We're talking about a few $10,000 of expenses here that you all have to deal with. You know, you have to do it at least drive the car for a day and, and drive it everywhere and drive it in every situation. By the way, bring it home and park it where you normally park it. Just that alone will give you an idea of how the car feels and everything. And also bring your friends in. As a side note, the Ford Fusion I, I test drove, they're very serious about um, sustainable materials. And it really made a difference. I have, the, again, my German friend who, who drives a lot of different cars, he's very, very, very sensitive to plastics, and it gives him a headache. This is the only car he was in he didn't have a problem with. So, again, had I had this car for only a, a, a 5, 10 minutes, half hour, I wouldn't have known this. But you have to have a car for longer than a half hour, long, I mean, ideally even longer than an hour. So salespeople have to listen, listen, not just talk, and not just bring people to another car. Just one more quick piece of advice. If you're going to test drive a car that you know that, like, say you know you want to buy the Ford Fusion, let me, my advice is drive the very base model because everything you get after that is nothing but ice cream. So drive the very, very base, and then when you go in to buy it, choose the options you want based on what you didn't like about the base model. That's the easiest way to do it. If you don't have the opportunity to drive one of every type, you know, every, every single model option or every single option they have for the car, drive the very base model and go up. Most dealerships will have very close to a base model on the lot. Go drive that and then put the icing on the cake going up the line and adding on the better stereo and whatever else you want. Adam, what were you going to say? Some dealerships do let you take the car home for a day if you sign all these paperwork, but usually at that point, they're either extremely confident you're going to buy it or they know you're on the edge and they're just trying to push you over. I did an article about what I think are the five greatest auto commercials of all time on my own blog, and uh, if anyone's interested, they can j just check that out. Probably one of the most interesting ones, I think, was this Ford Persian pinball park. It's kind of hard to describe, but you guys should check it out. <laughs> I know what one you're talking about. That's a great commercial. <laughs> And I also have the Honda Cog. And did you limit yourself to only American commercials, or were these worldwide? No, no. So did you include the uh, Clio commercial we talked about a couple of weeks ago? <laughs> I like that commercial. I think it's a lot of fun. I wouldn't say it's one of the best. That's that's my personal opinion. But maybe we can make up a new list on Car News Cafe. Well, now I'm going to go to your site and make sh and see what is on the list because I want to see what beat that out. See, because of Adam, I am about to see a Subaru commercial I have never seen before. How awesome is that? Go to adamsautoadvice.com. Cool. 
also did an article about Teens Drive Smart announce the winners. They do this video contest every year where people can submit videos for teen driver safety. And I'm always impressed. I remember when they first started this thing, you know, the videos were something you'd expect teenagers to make or people just in film school. Now they're getting more and more professional. <laughs> just something you guys could check out. I guess the last thing is Aaron had a Nissan truck this week, and then he'll be getting the gayest car in the world to test drive next week. Not quite the gayest car. It's not a smart. I'm getting a... Uh, <laughs> when they come and take the truck away from me, and they'll have to pry it from my... Well, I won't, I'm not going to say cold, dead hands. Not quite that hard. But when they pry this truck away from me, which and the truck, by the way, is currently covered in mud, when they pry this truck away from me, they're bringing me a Volkswagen Beetle, a new Beetle, so Volkswagen Beetle Turbo Convertible. At least they're not bringing it in some lame, girly color. It's in silver, which is at least generic. I am actually looking forward to this car, and that's simply because, one, my two little daughters have never ridden in a convertible, so I will be sure to try to film that. And also, it's the Turbo, you know? Turbo! So we'll see how fast it goes. I, I love driving Volkswagens, so I'll be interested to see if the bug lives up to uh, what I expect out of one. So, yeah, that'll be my test drive next week. We'll talk about it on Friday. I'll have had it for several days by then. By the way, uh, Aaron did ask for the uh, pale baby butt blue uh, color, and they told him, I'm sorry, sir, you are, don't look the type for that. And he said, oh, but I am, I am. <laughs> how about pink? Do you have pink? <laughs> It comes in a pastel pink. <laughs> this is Nicholas Zart signing off for Car News Cafe. And yes, please check us out on uh, Facebook.com slash Car News Cafe or Google Plus. I'm uh, pretty active on the uh, EV forum. And let us know what you think because it's one thing to write about what we love and it's one thing to uh, extol the virtues of the cars that we like. But we'd like to hear about you guys. We'd like to hear what you think, what you want to hear, what you want to know because that helps us make things even more relevant for you. Signing up for Car News Cafe. Again, this is Nick Lazard, and have a great week. All right. Well, this is Aaron Turpin for carnewscafe.com. Like us on Facebook. Like our, like our page. Make friends with us. Come say hello. Leave messages. Tell us what you think. And if you have any questions or anything you think that we should talk about on this podcast, go to town. Let it, send them to us. Tweet us. Facebook us. Email us. Whatever. Let us know if you want us to talk about something specific. Hey, everyone, this is Adam Yamada Hanf, and I'm signing off for Car News Cafe. You can check out our Car News Cafe Google Plus community. It's not a page, unlike what these guys said, which is why I was confused, just so we're clear. Uh, you can also tweet us questions for next week's podcasts on Twitter at Car News Cafe. And I hope everybody has a great week. And let us know if you have any questions again. Bye-bye. What you guys need to be doing is watching my videos of cars where you can see me doing things like wearing cowboy hats and scratching my own buttocks. My face was meant for television. <laughs> Unlike both of you. <laughs> <laughs>